Ladies and gentlemen, we were delaying just a bit. Our guest speaker hadn't arrived yet, but we're going to go ahead and get started, and hopefully he'll arrive uh, during the ceremony. So uh, if I can have everybody uh, 
please stand. Led by their class president, Officer Anthony Andujar, I present to you Dallas Police Department Basic Recruit Class 288. We'll begin our program today with the flag presentation presented by the Dallas Police Department Tactical Honor Guard, the singing of the national anthem by the Dallas Police Choir, followed by the, the prayer, uh, Dallas Police Chaplain Domingo Azuna. Detail, halt, present, on. bow your heads as we pray our Heavenly Father we thank you for this day you have given us for all your blessings for your protection and we thank you Lord for living in a nation that is free and that is good to us we thank you for that we thank you this afternoon as we come to the graduation of class 288 we want to thank you for the 32 hard working weeks that they had and they have made it. I pray, Lord, that you would be with them as they go out into the fields next week. And we pray for their wives, their children, their moms and dads. And we just uh, pray for your protection upon all of them. Thank you again for allowing us to be here today for this joyful moment. For it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated.
Uh, right now, I'd like to have ask the Dallas Police Choir to sing another selection. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Lieutenant Robert Owens, commander of the Basic Training Unit, Dallas Police Academy. It's my pleasure you, to welcome you to the graduation of Basic Recruit Class 288. I wish to acknowledge here their achievements of these officers and to wish them well as they be begin their careers as Dallas police officers. First of all, I'd like to introduce the members of the command staff and honored guests we have on stage with us. First, uh, Chief Police David Kunkel. First Assistant Chief David O'Brown, Assistant Chief Thomas Ward, Council Member Ron Natansky, and Deputy Chief Floyd Simpson. We also here to my right have the class president, Anthony Andahar, who will be presenting his uh, comments here in just a few minutes. I'd also like to acknowledge the members of the command staff and city officials who are sitting to my right in the front row. Uh, also, uh, command members of the training academy, starting uh, on the end here, Sergeant David Welsh. These are the academy staff that are responsible for training Class 2-8A. Senior Corporal Bobby Parrott, Class Coordinator. Thank you. Senior Corporal <laughs> <laughs> Kelly Canterbury is a Defensive Tactics and Physical Tactics Instructor. And Senior Corporal Karen McNamara, who just helps out. <laughs> She's. Uh, next, I'd like to uh, uh, address your attention to the screen. We have a video presentation. Uh, I'd like to recognize the members of the multimedia instruction team for exporting portion of our program. This videotape has been prepared for you to provide an idea of what training at the police academy is like. Let me see if I can get this down there. The screen's down. All right, there we go. Dallas poli police recruits go through 32 weeks of academy training. A recruit's ability to stand the mental stress and physical challenges of a law enforcement career begins at the academy. During these 32 weeks, some recruits distinguish themselves above their peers by demonstration, demonstrating proficiency in areas that are key to a successful career for the Dallas Police Department. We hope you enjoy this presentation.
part of Class 288 has been a great honor for me. This is my second time through the Academy. The first time was 10 years ago, and I left after five years to pursue a different career. And I realized that what was missing in my other career was the brotherhood and camaraderie that comes with being a police officer. In the classroom, we had uh, quite a few subjects that we had to uh, not only understand, but also have a good uh, working knowledge of, including uh, U.S. constitutional law, Texas laws, penal code, and coded criminal procedures. One of the most challenging things is really being prepared for the test every Monday. The test, there's a lot of information that was covered the week before, and sometimes maybe two or three weeks before, and the test on Monday morning were probably the most challenging. Classroom instructors were of uh, very high quality who not only gave us the good information that we needed for uh, the subject matter, but also brought with them the years of experience that they had and gave us that as well. PT training definitely was challenging, but uh, definitely rewarding as well. Um, the, the DT instructors uh, pushed us every opportunity they could to get our best and to perform uh, better than we thought we could. And I think it was evident that uh, in our class uh, we saw people who really improved over, over the course of time. I think just like in anything, you know, you try to uh, perform at a, at a certain level, but I think the, the PT staff always found a way to push you just a little bit harder to give you a little bit more and make you uh, give a little bit more as well back to them and I think um, that's I think most people uh, rose to that that challenge you know most people can do some push-ups and some jumping jacks and and run a mile and a half but the defensive tactics really required some more thinking to really think about what it is that you needed to do uh, in order to perform in this job. We learned handcuffing as well as wrist locks and straight arm bar takedowns. And of course all this was culminated with Red Man. First time that you have to go put hands on somebody, you really have to know what, what it is you're going to do. And um, compared to PT, you know, anybody can uh, lift a, a lot of weight or run a long distance, but defensive tactics really about technique and that's really uh, where we learn how to perform as a police officer. At the range, we learned to shoot proficiently. We shot pistols, shotgun, both day and night. And our class had the highest average of all the classes since they've been taking records. Safety was uh, paramount at the range. Uh, we learned how not only to shoot a gun, but also how to handle it safely. The instructors at the range were very, very knowledgeable and very patient with us and very thorough when teaching us not only shooting but uh, safety techniques as well. PVOC was also another opportunity for the recruits to really put themselves to the test. Not only to learn how to drive a police vehicle but also to drive it fast, in control, safely. PVLC not only taught us how to drive fast and safely, but also use proper techniques like shuffle steering and clearing the intersections, which will come in very handy when in real world situations. The most fun thing we did at the Academy, I think, was driving fast. Most important thing that we learned at the Academy probably was officer safety and how to conduct our business on a day-to-day -day basis, but conduct it safely so that nobody would get hurt. During Situation Simulation was the first time that the recruits had the opportunity to take the information that they learned in the classroom and apply it to a real-world situation. This caused a lot of anxiety as well as adrenaline, but I think it was a very eye-opening experience for everybody to see that they could handle the situation when they came about. We had the opportunity to really put together everything that we have learned in the Academy. Not only the laws that were applicable, but also the techniques of driving the squad car to the call, finding the call, marking out on the call, and then handling the call once we got there. Several of the class members distinguished themselves in leadership, academics, physical training, and marksmanship. The Esprit de Corps Award, as voted by the class members themselves, 
recognizes an individual officer for their unselfish display of class spirit and assistance to their fellow classmates. This award goes to Officer Nathan Foreman. The following officers distinguished themselves in the area of motor fitness performance and were the top athletes in the class. Third place, with a score of 93.8, Officer David Cortez. Second place, with a score of 94.2, Officer Robert King. And first place, with a score of 95.6, Officer Tara Smith. The following officers have distinguished themselves in the area of firearms marksmanship. Third place, with a score of 99.2, Officer James Jones. Second place, with a score of 99.4, Officer Kenton Hubner. And first place, with a score of 100, Officer Stephen Blosser. The following officers distinguished themselves in the classroom with academic excellence. Third place, with a score of 90.63, Officer Philip Rawson. Second place, with a score of 91.69, Officer Allison Madsen. And first place, with a score of 92.44, Officer Tara Smith. These officers distinguished themselves as having the highest overall GPAs and takes into account academic averages, motor fitness scores, and marksmanship scores. Third place, with a score of 92.16, Officer Robert King. Second place, with a score of 92.9, Officer Allison Matson. And first place, with a score of 93.84, Officer Tara Smith. My name is Tony Andujar, and I'm from New York City. I'm Matt Bacon from Wills Point, Texas. My name is Steve Wasser, and I'm from Dallas, Texas. John Shashoka, and I'm from South Bend, Indiana. I'm James Coddington from upstate New York. I'm David Cortez from San Antonio, Texas. I'm Brian Cruz from Athens, Texas. I'm Donnie Dean from Columbia, Mississippi. I'm Brooke Deloach from Cedar Hill, Texas. I'm Nathan Foreman from Terrell, Texas. I'm Joseph Giles from Garland, Texas. I'm Kent Hubner from Conway, Arkansas. I'm Patrick Jibb from Irving, Texas. I'm James Jones, I'm from Dallas, Texas. I'm Chris King from Knox City, Texas. I'm Shayna Lopez from Arlington, Texas. I'm Allison Matson from Farmington, Minnesota. I'm David Meldrum from Central Illinois. I'm Raquel Oliver from Duncanville, Texas. I'm Philip Rawson from Celeste, Texas. I'm Domingo Rivera from Dunkirk, New York. I'm Rene Sanchez from Dallas, Texas. I'm Nicholas Sears from Dallas, Texas. I'm Brent Smith from Rockwell, Texas. I'm Terry Smith from Louisville, Texas. I'm Mark Streeter from Arlington, Texas. I'm Michael Villa from Buffalo, New York. I'm Tani Welling from Garland, Texas. I'm Chris Wood from Cloquet, Minnesota. To me, being a police officer is a challenge, but not only is it uh, self-rewarding in doing a good job, but also in really providing the service for the citizens of Dallas and doing the best job that you could possibly do on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd now like to bring up the class president, Officer Andahar, for his presentation. That was a, a pretty good video. When they asked me to make a couple of comments uh, that they would use maybe one or two of them for the video, I didn't know they were going to use every single comment that I made. But um, Chief Kunkel, an honored guest 
on behalf of Class 288, I would like to thank you for providing us with this fantastic opportunity to celebrate our accomplishments. I would also especially like to thank the Academy staff, Lieutenant Owens, Sergeant Lawton, who is not here today, um, Corporal Parrott, Corporal Canterbury, and of course, our mentor and class advisor, Corporal Barton. Your professionalism and commitment to us has ensured that we would be here today fit and ready to serve. Most importantly, I would like to thank all the family and friends who join us today to share in this very happy and proud moment and for all your support and understanding during the past eight months. Class 288, who are we? We came to the Dallas Police Academy 32 weeks ago as strangers, a diverse group with interesting and varied backgrounds. For some of us, this was our first real job out of college. Some of us spent time in the military. Some of us, after having spent time in careers that seemed to be lacking, left those jobs to take on the challenge of a career with meaning and purpose. Some of us chose Dallas because of the diversity of work experience within the department or because of the excitement of a large city. Some of us had something to prove to our family, to our friends, and to ourselves that we could make it through one of the longest academies in the country and be a Dallas police officer. One of us simply came for the weather. <laughs> but I guess if you were from Buffalo, that would be understandable. <laughs> we came from all over the country. New York, Colorado, Minnesota, Indiana, Arkansas, and throughout the Metroplex. But regardless of our differences, or why or where we came from, we came together to form a very strong and cohesive group. Class 288 started on August 5th with 30 people and finished with 29. Class 288 has the distinction of setting an academy record at the firing range. As a class, our shooting score average for pistol day and night was an impressive 95.4, higher than any class since 1985. No matter where Class 288 went, we continually received compliments from the instructors and staff on our teamwork and our overall attitude to get things done. Some days seemed long and it was difficult to stay focused. Other days seemed to fly by. Sometimes we learned so much new information that it seemed impossible to retain it all. Almost every Monday brought with it stress and self-doubt and the question, am I ready for this test? But along the way, we had fun. We had fun learning to drive the police vehicle operations course. We learned the definition of dang drugs. <laughs> and of course, we all learned how to do the happy hands dance. We learned that if you, drop your fire, if you drop your gun during the first day of firearms training, you will definitely earn a nickname. <laughs> we learned how to shuffle steer and why it's important. Also, you must turn on your lights and sirens before initiating a pursuit. We found out that if you ask a friend as a favor to make a class banner, it may never get done. <laughs> and, it will, and it would become the, the, uh, the source of constant jokes and pranks. <laughs> Best of all, we got to find out what OC pepper spray tastes like. I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> we learned to stay flexible and open to changes in our schedule and to have our PT gear ready just in case. Along the way, we bonded and we learned a little bit about ourselves and what we are capable of. We became less like individual members of a class and more like a family. Today, our shift begins. We will be clear and available for service. Today, we become part of a larger family, a part of the Dallas Police Department. Courage, 
integrity, and service are just words to some, but today we are tasked to live by those words and entrusted by the community to uphold and perform our work daily by a higher standard. Some might say that the past 32 weeks were the most difficult test of our abilities. I think the most difficult test will be the days, the weeks, and the years to come. Every day will be a test, a test of our knowledge of what we have learned here and what we will continue to learn on the streets. Every day will test our integrity and test our courage and commitment to protect and serve the citizens of Dallas. A quote by George Orwell reminds me of the importance and significance of our profession. Mr. Orwell said, we sleep safely in our beds because rough men stand ready in the night to visit violence on those who would harm us. But being a police officer is more than just being the protector of the wrong. It is both equal parts valor and compassion. It reminds me of a story of a man who took a walk along the beach after a storm. As he walked, he noticed a starfish that had washed up on the beach. The man knew the starfish needed to be in the water and could only survive a short time on the beach. So he picked up the starfish and he threw it back into the water. As he walked a short distance further, he came, came upon another starfish. Again, he picked it up and threw it back into the water. As he looked ahead, he noticed thousands of starfish that had washed up on the beach. He began to pick them up one by one and throw them back into the water. As he continued to throw starfish into the water, a second man who was walking the beach from the opposite direction stopped and asked, what are you doing? The first man replied, I'm saving all these starfish. If they don't get back into the ocean, they will die. The second man said, well, there are thousands of these starfish all the way down the beach. There is no way you can save them all. There is no way you can make a difference. The first man bent over and picked up another starfish and threw it back into the water. He then turned to the second man and said, yes, but for that starfish, I've made all the difference. The world is full of starfish. Make a difference when you can. But remember, you are only one person. There is no way to save all the starfish. If there's a way to make a difference, find it. This following Monday will bring with it a familiar and nervous feeling. It will be filled with stress and self-doubt. We will have more questions and answers. And many of us will wonder, as we have before, am I ready for this test? This test is not graded by a Scantron, but it will have much more at stake. This test will be different because you will not be alone. You will have your police family with you. Folks, in regards to the career in which we are about to embark, I promise you it will be the most challenging and most fun we have ever had. Because why? Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd now like to uh, call on Chief Police David M. Kunkel for his remarks. Chief. I've been a uh, police chief now for over 22 years, and uh, I'm not sure I heard a better graduation speech than I did today. And uh, I'm very, very proud of Class 288 and Officer Andahar, and uh, particularly appreciate the comments. It, Graduations, it's hard for me not to reflect backwards because 34 years ago I became a Dallas police officer. It defined who I was, uh, essentially was raised by the department. Uh, many of my values were taught in the academy and becoming a young officer. I loved everything the department represented, helping uh, the people that needed help, making a difference. I loved wearing the uniform. I, uh, try to wear my uniform every day because I uh, value what it represents and the badge and everything about being a uh, police officer in a big city. 
Your, your jobs uh, will be very difficult. It's never been easy being a Dallas officer, but as I look forward, I sincerely believe the best days are ahead of this city and of this department. I see a renaissance in the city of Dallas. Our economy uh, is right on the cusp of booming. Our neighborhoods are getting better. Uh, within the community, the uh, Dallas department, I think, enjoys more support than we've enjoyed in our past. Officers are appreciated. The department will grow. There'll be many opportunities for each of you to uh, transfer, get promoted, whatever you want your career, career to be. Uh, it'll, it'll work out for you here in Dallas. I'm very proud to be here. I'm honored to be here. I'm here with a great amount of humility. I respect what you've accomplished, uh, probably more so than a lot of uh, people in the room. When I uh, quit being a police chief in Arlington, I let my uh, Ticlios license expire, so I had to study uh, to take the exam, which I'd never had taken before, so I even have an appreciation how difficult and comprehensive the amount of uh, knowledge and information you have to uh, to have to pass that exam. We are honored that you're here. Uh, you'll have a great career. The city desperately needs you. Treat the people in the city with respect and they will show it uh, more than in kind. Uh, I would encourage you to move to the city. There's a great neighborhoods, things to do in the town, and I think in the future being a resident of the city may have extra value within your career, but we are proud of you and you've accomplished a great deal, Class 288. Thank you. Okay, now it's time everybody's waiting for Class 288, prepare for graduation. Right up. We have a photographer here that will uh, be memorializing the uh, presentation of each certificate. If you, wish to, if you wish to take a personal photograph, feel free to come up over to the right side. The photographer will be around here. If you'll stay to the, the right of them, take all the photographs you want. Uh, however, just remain behind our photographer, please. Chief Kunkel, I certify that the members of class 288 have successfully completed the requirements set forth by this department, the City of Dallas, and the requirements set forth by the Texas Commission on Law Enforcement Standards and Education. I present to you for graduation, members of class 288. Officer Anthony, Anduhar. <laughs> Officer Matthew Bacon. Officer Stephen Flosser. <laughs> Officer John Shashoka. Officer James Coddington. <laughs> Officer David Cortez. Officer Brian Cruz.
Officer Donald Dean. Officer Brooke Deloach. <laughs> Officer Nathan Foreman. Officer Joseph Giles. <laughs> Officer Kenton Hubner. Officer Patrick Job. <laughs> Officer James Jones. <laughs> Officer Robert King. Officer Shanna Lopez. <laughs> Officer Allison Matson. Officer David Meldrum. <laughs> Officer Raquel Oliver. Officer Philip Rawlson. <laughs> Officer Domingo Rivera. Officer Rene Sanchez. <laughs> Officer Nicholas Sears. Officer Brent Smith. <laughs> Officer Tara Smith. Officer Mark Streeter.
Officer Michael Villa. Officer Tammy Welling. <laughs> Officer Christopher Wood. Ladies and gentlemen, and I present to you the officers of Class 288. Good afternoon. Uh, I am Deputy Chief Floyd Simpson and I have the honor of uh, making the introduction of our guest speaker. Uh, he had an emergency and uh, he was running a little bit late, but I think what he has to say is very important uh, to our group. So I've asked him to speak uh, maybe uh, five or ten minutes to the group and uh, from there we'll move forward in our program. Uh, judge Cruzot is uh, the presiding judge of our Dallas County's Criminal District Court Number 4. He gathered the Dallas County Drug Court through inception and its initial growing pains. He was named as a pioneer judge by the National Association of Drug Court Professionals in June of 2000 for his contributions to the drug treatment court uh, field and is in uh, the Drug Court Hall of Fame. Uh, he's a member of the National Association of the Drug Court Professionals and he has served as the faculty for the National Drug Court Institute on issues such as ethics, confidentiality, and sanctions and incentives. Uh, Judge Cruzo serves on the Texas Board of Criminal Justice Judiciary Advisory Council, uh, which is a committee that advises the Board of the Texas Department of Criminal Justice on matters related to probation. Uh, he's recently been appointed to the American Bar Association Commission on Effective Criminal Sanctions and also serves as the advisor to the American Law Institute's uh, Model Penal Code sen Sentencing Project. In September of 2005, uh, the judge was named Outstanding Jurist of the Year. Uh, by the State Bar of Texas Criminal Bar Section. In January of 05, he was honored as the Dallas Bar Association with the Martin Luther King Jr. Justice Award. Uh, he serves on uh, Governor Rick Perry's Anti-Crime Committee and the Texas Punishment Standards Commission. He was appointed by uh, former Mayor Kirk to serve on the City of Dallas Task Force on Ethics and is a member of the City of Dallas Homeless Task Force. Uh, Joe Cruzo is, is a graduate of SMU School of Law uh, prior to that, he uh, served in a private practice, and he was also a chief felony prosecutor for Dallas County. Uh, he is a member of the Texas and Dallas Bar Associations and a fellow of the Texas Bar Foundation. Uh, he serves on the executive committee of SMU Univer University's Dedman School of Law and was recognized a distinguished alumnus by the Dedman School of Law in 2000. He has received the president's, president's citation from the University of North Texas. Uh, he is the current presiding judge uh, of the 15 felony courts in our county. Uh, he's certainly a friend of the city, the police department, and a friend of mine. And I'll ask you to come forward and just make a few comments, Judge. Thank you. I want to apologize for being late, but I'll tell you why in just a moment. But first of all, congratulations to each and every one of you. I know you're very proud today, proud of yourselves, and I've never been to a graduation. It's been a while, actually, but with so many people here to support you all. So I know your families are proud. And uh, actually, what I want you all to do for a moment is stand up and give a big clap and applause to your family who's supported you all, if you don't mind doing it seriously. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. You know, this is an exciting time for the city to have, um, however many, I haven't actually counted you all, to have you all and uh, come forth. Um, it's a great 
training program here. You're with one of the best police departments, if not the best, I think, in the, in the country. Uh, we've got a command staff that's second to none. We have a police chief that's second to none, and I'm excited to be here. Um, let me tell you a little bit why I'm late. It's actually a message for everybody here. It's a very appropriate message uh, to be here. Um, back in 1988, there was a burglary somewhere here in Dallas County. I don't even know what city it was in. And um, there was a woman in the house, it was at night, and she was sexually assaulted, and they developed a suspect. She gave an identification of a suspect. This is a true story, I'm not making this up. Uh, she gave an identification of a suspect, a white male, um, and she said he had a very interesting feature about him. She saw on his shoulder, starting here on his shoulder and going down his shoulder blade and kind of into the middle of his back, a very distinctive tattoo of a woman at the side of her face and a very long hair tattooed on the, this person's back. And they developed a suspect, and this suspect had almost the exact tattoo on him. And she gave that before they developed the suspect. I mean, it's not like she said he had a tattoo after she saw a tattoo. This is what she said at the time. This man was prosecuted. Uh, it's 1988, free DNA. Um, he was prosecuted, convicted, and received a 50-year sentence. And um, he appealed his case. His, his conviction was affirmed, and, and he went on. Well, I don't know, two or three years ago, he wrote me a letter and says, I'm innocent and I've been convicted of this crime, and now that DNA testing is available, and now that we have a statute on it, I want to have a test, and I appointed him a lawyer, and the lawyer began the process of finding whatever materials were left, going to the labs, what have you, back through the police departments, through the court reporters, and uh, there was material, and with that, I had to sign an order to have it tested, and we had some tested, and it was uh, biological material from the lady. There was a cigarette butt that the lady said that the perpetrator of this crime came in and smoked a cigarette and one or two cigarettes and left them right there and they got DNA material from that. She said, I don't smoke, my boyfriend doesn't smoke, nobody smokes in this house, the perpetrator left that, he's the perpetrator, that's the guy in the penitentiary. So we got these items and got the biological material from her and found out that yes, there was something there to test and something there to test on the cigarette butt also, DNA material on that. And uh, so we sent it off for a test, and the test came back, and they said, well, we got some, but it's, it kind of probably isn't him, but we're not sure. And the state said, we have a, you know, super duper, you know, recent technology test that either it's him or it's not, but it'll take a while. And this man's been locked up since 1988. And they sent it off for the super duper test, and they tested it, and they got the lady, they found the lady and got, got some DNA from her, and found her boyfriend and got some DNA from him so they could do these tests right. And of course, they have the suspect who's in prison and they got some DNA from him. And this case was set for a hearing today. And unfortunately, two days ago, the Dallas County Sheriff's Department, through just an honest mistake, inadvertently released this man back to the penitentiary and his hearing was today. So we show up to have this hearing and all the reports say that they've tested the biological material from this woman and it's not him. And they got the cigarette butt and it's not him. None of this was from this man. An absolute certainty that it wasn't him. And I've got a situation where this guy has been in prison way too long, and they shipped him back. And so the reason I'm late is I've been on a phone call. I've talked to every, anybody I could find so we can go get this man tomorrow morning and bring him back from this unit and have him here Monday morning so I can sign this paperwork. And that's not necessarily the end of it, because uh, technically when I get somebody back from the penitentiary like that, they're in custody of the penitentiary system. They just kind of loaned them to us, right? And so now I've got this situation was when I have this, what am I going to do? Am I going to let this man go back to the penitentiary for some more until the higher courts get it? And so I had to get on the phone and talk to TDC and talk to the Chief Justice of the Court of Criminal Appeals to figure out on Monday what I can do to get this man out. And so I'm sorry, that's why I'm late, because I got so wrapped up in that. And oh, by the way, the warden's out of pocket over there, so couldn't find him, and he didn't return any phone calls, so that was another problem. But anyway, that's why I'm late. And, and, and it just goes to show, look at all the good work that everybody did on that case. Everybody well-intended, prosecutors on back, maybe to even to this lady. I mean, I don't know what, what went wrong, but it just goes to show you that mistakes can happen, and when they do and we discover them, we, ha we need to do everything we can to, to stop that and get these folks out of prison. And hopefully, 
you know, none of us here, you all, or me, and, and my future in criminal justice will ever make that mistake. By God, unfortunately, it does happen, and we got to live up to it when it does. We have to be honest about it, and we have to correct our mistakes. I hope everybody understands that. Now, let me tell you why they asked me to come. Talk to you about what I do outside of just doing this kind of stuff, calling balls and strikes on cases. And it's the thing that's going to confront you. I don't care what assignment you have in DPD. You're going to be confronted with, and that's drugs and alcohol, and the impact that those substances have on our community. And what I've been doing, when they were talking all that stuff, you know, it's kind of like, my, as my five-year-old says, blah, 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 you know, who you are and what you did. Uh, what's the bottom line is? The bottom line is we've got some programs here in Dallas County um, in cooperation a lot with DPD, especially this police chief, um, to really address these things and, and really deal with these offenders that are arrested rightfully so and taken down to jail and prosecuted rightfully so but they come in and present themselves as individuals who have either long or very short histories of, of, of drugs and alcohol, and that's what's fueling their criminal behavior. And if you don't know it, if you haven't been on a police force, some of you may have, you're gonna find that out in short order, okay? That's a lot of what's going on. Probably 80 to 90% of the crime out there is alcohol and drug fuel. And so what we're doing is we're putting these people in specialized programs, and it's a lot harder than probation. It's a lot more accountable than probation. It's a lot more effective than prison, where we're actually going in and changing their lives and making them, forcing them to change their lives uh, for the better. And what does that get? Well, hopefully it'll get you all a lot less work on the street. Because what we know is, is when we put these people through these programs, there's a 68% reduction in new arrests. And that's meaningful. Um, even when we do it with the population that's got a long felony criminal record, which some of us are doing that now, even when they are out on the streets, and the control group that they're compared against has been locked up in state jails or penitentiaries, they still have 35% fewer new arrests than the group who went to prison. And why? Because they're drug cases and they're letting them out about as quick as they can get there sometimes. They're doing state jail felonies. I know that you all know from your academy experience, what's the minimum punishment of state jail felony? 180 days. What's the maximum sentence? Two years. You got that, right? Well, guess what these guys are getting, 180 days. You can count on it almost every time. That's what they're going to get, right? And they got some back time for being arrested. If they're drug addicts, guess what? You're going to see them in less than six months. More than likely, you're going to be back there hauling them in again, okay? And that's what we're trying to address in these programs is get these people in the programs, get their lives straight, get them right, so you good folks don't have to see them again going through this merry-go-round exercise with them, okay? So there's hope out there, there's promise out there. We're trying to do the best we can, and we want to support you and help you do the best you can. We're very proud of you. Um, I look forward to seeing you. If you're down at the courthouse, I, I, I got a bad memory, so, but anyway, you need to come by seriously and let me know um, that, that I spoke at your class. Now, let me tell you a little story. Back in 1995, they asked me to speak to the uh, SMU Law School graduate, graduating class, and I, I'm a 1982 graduate, and I did. And I started off by telling them when I went back to talk to my classmates about who the person was and what they spoke about at my graduation, nobody knew who it was and nobody knew what they spoke about, right? So that's how long this kind of stuff stays. So I got some real controversial stuff out there, and I threw it out there in a controversial way, and I told the class that I wanted to do it that way to maybe they could remember me and remember what I said. And this is a true story. This past summer on a 4th of July party in my neighborhood, I ran in some guy, and he had an SMU law shirt on, and I said, well, did you go to SMU? Oh, yeah. When did you finish? 95. I said, did you go through the graduation exercise? Yeah. And I said, yeah, how was it? Well, it's nice. I mean, how was graduation? It was pretty nice. I said, yeah. I said, what are those graduations like? Oh, they like everything else. They had some dumb speaker come up there and talk, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. So I said, yeah. I said, I've been through some of those. I, those are usually boring. I said, so what, do you even remember who spoke? Yeah, some crazy judge from down at the courthouse. <laughs> that, this is a true story. I said, what are you talking about? He was insane. That's all I can tell you. He was talking about this and that. And I don't know what the H -E, you know, he was talking about, but he was off base, you know? So. I said, what did he talk about? Well, I don't even remember. Well, if he's off base, how do you know? Well, it's just stupid. That's all I know. <laughs> and so I said, well, who was it? I don't know. I don't, well, what does he do? I don't know. Some judge from somewhere. What is it? Civil judge? A crum I don't even remember. He was stupid, you know? <laughs> and so I said, well, I was there. He said, yeah, well, he, I said, yeah, I was at that graduation. I think I, think I remember his name. Was it something like Crew, Crew something, Cruz, Crenshaw, Cruzo? Yeah, Cru Cruzo, that was it. Yeah. So I said, well, don't you remember anything he said? No. I said, well, at least you remember him, right? Well, yeah. You remember he was there, right? Yeah. I said, well, that's better than my graduating class because we didn't remember who was there or what they talked about. I said, you remember him talking about that? Yeah, he did say something about that. 
Just so, by the way, I'm that guy. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, he was eating that for a while. He's very uncomfortable, as you can well imagine. So. <laughs> but anyway, if you can, remember this, okay? And uh, if you want to, come by and say hello. Congratulations to you all and to your families. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. On Thursday, when the officers of Class 288 received their badges, they took the official oath of office. On this occasion, we'll ask the officers of 288 to publicly rededicate themselves to serve our community by reciting the oath of public service. Sergeant Welch. Class 288. Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I do solemnly swear, I do solemnly swear that, I will serve the community, that I will serve the community, safeguard lives and property, safeguard lives and property protect, the innocent, protect the innocent, keep the peace, keep the peace and, ensure the rights, and ensure the rights of liberty, equality, and justice for all. Of liberty, equality, and justice for all. And that I will. And that I will Treat all citizens equally. Treat all citizens equally. With courtesy, dignity, and respect. With courtesy, dignity, and respect. And furthermore, and furthermore, I will conduct my official duties. I will conduct my official duties. And my personal life in such a manner. And my personal life in such a manner. As to inspire confidence and honor. As to inspire confidence and honor. For the position of public trust I hold. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you. Go ahead and drop your hands. Remain at attention. As we close out our program, I'd like to ask the chaplain to offer the benediction. Will everyone please? Congratulations, Class 288. Uh, you will have your own chaplains in every station where you're going, but I'm always available if you can't find them. Love you guys. I know you want to get out of here. Uh, I'm not going to preach a sermon. I won't keep you long. Uh, I'm going to tell you what Elizabeth Taylor told her last husband. I won't keep you long. <laughs> <laughs> Will you bow your heads as we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for this class, for what they have accomplished. We're proud of them, and we know they're going to serve our city well. Thank you for the academy staff, the fine job they have done. And thank you for Chief Conco for what he's doing for our city. And Lord, I pray for the officers as they go out to their jobs, that you will bring them safely at the end of their chief. We pray, Lord, that uh, you would protect them and that your angel will always be with them, there for them. We ask you to bless our city, and we ask you, Lord, to bless America. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you very much. Class 288, effective immediately, your transfer of the Dallas Police Academy to the Patrol Bureau. Officer Andahar, please call your class to attention and render the class motto for the last time. All right. Hunt, Protect and serve whatever it takes, 288. Dismiss. Thank you. That concludes our program. <laughs>